Hi guys, and welcome back to Metacaucus. We've got a new video packed with fresh high yield topics for your USMLE step one prep. Let's dive in. In our first case, we have a 26 year old man who presents with a three week history of shortness of breath, cough and hemoptysis, which was preceded by an upper respiratory infection. He has no fever or weight loss, but his blood pressure is elevated at 150 over 85 and creatinine levels are markedly high at 4.1 milligrams per deciliter. Urinalysis shows proteinuria, hematuria, and dysmorphic red blood cells, all signs of glomerular injury. Chest x-ray reveals bilateral pulmonary infiltrates and pulmonary function testing shows an increased carbon monoxide diffusing capacity, indicating alveolar hemorrhage. This presentation is classic for good pasture syndrome, which involves autoantibodies targeting the alpha-3 chain of type 4 collagen in the glomerular basement membrane and pulmonary capillaries. These antibodies initiate an inflammatory response that damages both the kidneys and lungs, causing rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis and alveolar hemorrhage. Patients with this condition often present with hematuria, edema, and signs of acute kidney injury, as seen in this case with elevated creatinine. The lung involvement results in hemoptysis and increased carbon monoxide diffusing capacity due to blood in the alveoli. On renal biopsy, glomerular crescents are typically seen, and immunofluorescence reveals linear IgG and C3 deposits along the glomerular basement membrane, a hallmark of good pasture syndrome. Next case, a 43-year-old man comes to the office with shortness of breath, fatigue, and recent weight gain. He also reports ankle swelling, which has been progressively worsening. His blood pressure is elevated at 168 over 94, and a urinalysis shows 2 plus protein, hematuria, and mild purea. A kidney biopsy is performed, and immunofluorescence microscopy reveals linear deposits of IgG along the glomerular basement membrane, confirming the diagnosis of good pasture syndrome. This patient's findings of hematuria, proteinuria, and hypertension suggest a nephritic syndrome, while the biopsy showing linear IgG deposits along the glomerular basement membrane is characteristic of anti-glomerular basement membrane disease. In good pasture syndrome, these antibodies attack the alpha-3 chain of type 4 collagen, leading to a rapidly progressive form of glomerulonephritis, known as crescentic glomerulonephritis. On light microscopy, we expect to see glomerular crescent formation, which consists of proliferating parietal cells, macrophages, and fibrin, indicating severe glomerular injury. This patient will also likely develop pulmonary involvement with symptoms of hemoptysis due to alveolar hemorrhage as the same antibodies target the lungs. To summarize, good pasture syndrome is an autoimmune condition that primarily affects the kidneys and lungs due to antibodies targeting the alpha-3 chain of type 4 collagen. Clinically, it presents with features of rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis, including hematuria, proteinuria, and renal failure, as well as pulmonary hemorrhage with hemoptysis. Key findings include linear IgG deposits on immunofluorescence and glomerular crescents on light microscopy. Early recognition and treatment are critical to prevent irreversible kidney and lung damage. Next up, we're diving into membranous urethral injuries, which commonly result from high-speed trauma, such as motor vehicle collisions. These injuries are often linked with pelvic fractures. Let's explore a classic case to understand the key clinical points. Our patient is a 45-year-old man who was involved in a high-speed motor vehicle collision. He presents with lower abdominal pain, a sensation of bladder fullness, and inability to urinate since the accident. On examination, he has suprapubic tenderness, and trauma workup reveals pelvic fractures and rib fractures. Given this presentation, the most likely diagnosis is a posterior urethral injury, specifically at the membranous urethra. Let's break this down. The urethra is divided into two main segments, the anterior and posterior urethra. The posterior urethra includes the prostatic and membranous urethra, while the anterior urethra includes the penile and bulbar urethra. 
In cases of pelvic fractures, the membranous urethra is the most vulnerable segment due to its fixed position within the pelvis. It is anchored by supportive structures like the urogenital diaphragm, making it susceptible to tearing when the pelvis is displaced or fractured as seen in this patient. The hallmark symptoms of posterior urethral injury include the inability to urinate despite a sensation of bladder fullness, blood at the urethral meatus, and in some cases, a high riding prostate on digital rectal examination. This occurs because the torn membranous urethra disrupts the flow of urine, causing it to accumulate and extravasate into surrounding tissues, leading to bladder distension and a sensation of fullness. In this case, the CT scan showing a pelvic fracture combined with the clinical presentation of urinary retention and suprapubic tenderness strongly suggests that the membranous urethra is injured. This is supported by the anatomy of the posterior urethra, which is more prone to injury and pelvic trauma due to its fixed position between the bladder and the urogenital diaphragm. In contrast, injuries to the anterior urethra, particularly the penile and bulbar segments, are typically seen with straddle injuries or blunt force trauma to the perineum, rather than in the setting of pelvic fractures. Additionally, the prostatic urethra is generally protected by the surrounding prostate tissue and is less frequently injured in these cases. To summarize, in cases of pelvic fractures, posterior urethral injuries are common, particularly at the membranous urethra. The clinical presentation of urinary retention, suprapubic tenderness, and blood at the urethral matus should prompt suspicion of a posterior urethral tear. An immediate evaluation is necessary to prevent complications such as urinary leakage and further damage to the urogenital tract. Next, let's take a look at this case which highlights the clinical features we often see with urge incontinence. This case involves an 80-year-old woman who presents with progressively worsening urinary incontinence. She reports that she often feels a strong urge to urinate and experiences leakage before reaching the bathroom. She also wakes up multiple times at night to urinate, and on examination, her post-void residual volume and urinalysis are normal. There is no leakage of urine with coughing or valsalva maneuver, and the pelvic examination is notable only for vaginal atrophy. This patient has classic urge incontinence, also known as overactive bladder syndrome. The pathophysiology behind this condition involves uninhibited contractions of the detrusor muscle, which leads to the sudden urge to void. Pharmacotherapy in such cases aims to either promote relaxation of the detrusor muscle or inhibit its contractions. The most appropriate treatment in this case would be a medication that stimulates beta-3 adrenergic receptors, such as mirabigron. Beta-3 receptor agonists cause relaxation of the detrusor smooth muscle, allowing for better urine storage and a reduction in incontinent episodes. This class of medications is often preferred in elderly patients due to fewer side effects compared to anti-muscarinic agents which can cause cognitive impairment and other systemic effects in this population. Next, we have a 36-year-old woman with a history of multiple sclerosis who reports frequent urination and urge incontinence following a recent exacerbation of her condition. She mentions that she has been experiencing difficulty holding her urine and often loses control before reaching the bathroom. Her post-void residual volume is low, ruling out overflow incontinence, and her neurological examination reveals hyperreflexia and increased tone in the lower extremities. In this case, the urge incontinence is likely due to detrusor hyperreflexia, a common consequence of upper motor neuron lesions seen in MS. Lesions above the sacral micturition center cause loss of inhibitory signals to the bladder, resulting in uninhibited bladder contractions. These patients often experience a sudden and frequent urge to urinate, and without proper neural control, they are unable to suppress the detrusor muscles contractions. Treatment options for these patients include anti-muscarinic agents or beta-3 adrenergic agonists to help suppress bladder contractions and reduce the frequency of urinary episodes.
In more advanced cases, patients may require intermittent catheterization or other management strategies if bladder dysfunction progresses. Finally, we have a 45-year-old man with a known diagnosis of multiple sclerosis who presents with urinary incontinence, increased frequency, and an inability to control the urge to urinate. On examination, he has spastic paraparesis with increased reflexes and a thoracic sensory level to pain and temperature. MRI reveals a new demyelinating lesion in the mid-thoracic spinal cord. This patient likely has a spastic bladder due to the presence of an upper motor neuron lesion affecting the spinal cord, causing bladder hypertonia. In MS, spinal cord lesions disrupt the normal inhibitory control of bladder contraction, leading to increased detrusor muscle tone and frequent urgent episodes of urination. This condition is common in patients with MS who develop upper motor neuron signs such as spasticity, hyperreflexia, and sensory abnormalities. Urodynamic studies in such patients would typically show increased bladder tone with a low residual urine volume, as the bladder can contract normally but does not relax properly. These patients may benefit from beta-3 agonists or antimuscarinics to reduce detrusor overactivity and improve symptoms. To summarize, urge incontinence is commonly caused by detrusor overactivity, leading to the sudden urge to void and involuntary leakage. Treatment typically involves medications that relax the detrusor muscle, such as beta-3 adrenergic agonists or anti-muscarinic agents. In patients with neurological conditions like multiple sclerosis, bladder dysfunction can evolve, and understanding the underlying pathology is crucial for effective management. Now, let's discuss membranoproliferative glomerulonephritis with a case highlighting its features, especially in chronic hepatitis B. This condition can cause both nephrotic and nephritic syndrome, and diagnosis is based on kidney biopsy findings. In this case, we have a 32-year-old man who presents with generalized edema and a history of chronic hepatitis B infection. Given this clinical picture, kidney disease is strongly suspected, prompting a renal biopsy to explore the underlying cause. Looking at the biopsy results, light microscopy reveals diffuse glomerular hypercellularity along with thickening of the capillary walls. Notably, there's the characteristic tram track appearance, which arises from mesangial cell proliferation and the production of new basement membrane material. This splitting of the glomerular basement membrane is a classic feature of membranoproliferative glomerulonephritis. As we move to the immunofluorescence findings, we see prominent granular staining for IgG and C3 along the basement membrane and in the mesangium. This granular pattern is important because it indicates immune complex deposition, which plays a central role in the development of MPGN. Next, on electron microscopy, we observe extensive subendothelial and mesangial deposits. These immune complexes, positioned between the endothelium and the glomerular basement membrane, cause significant inflammatory damage. Given the patient's history of hepatitis B infection, these findings strongly point toward membranoproliferative glomerulonephritis type 1, which is often associated with chronic infections like hepatitis B or C, autoimmune diseases, or certain malignancies. To understand the pathophysiology of MPGN, it's important to note that the immune complexes deposited in the subendothelial space and mesangium trigger the complement system. This activation results in inflammatory damage to the glomeruli, causing a mix of nephrotic syndrome symptoms, such as proteinuria and edema, and nephritic syndrome features, like hematuria with dysmorphic red blood cells. In cases like this, where chronic infections such as hepatitis B are involved, the immune complexes become trapped in the glomeruli, sparking inflammation and damage. This ongoing inflammation leads to the thickening of the capillary walls and mesangial cell proliferation, resulting in the hypercellularity that was observed under the microscope. In conclusion, this patient's renal biopsy highlights the hallmark features of membranoproliferative glomerulonephritis, most likely secondary to chronic hepatitis B infection. The diagnosis is confirmed by histologic findings such as glomerular hypercellularity, thickened capillary walls, and subendothelial immune complex deposition. 
Additionally, the granular staining of IgG and C3 on immunofluorescence and the tram track appearance on light microscopy are key diagnostic features of MPGN. Okay now, let's dive into a case of nodular glomerulosclerosis associated with diabetic nephropathy, one of the most common causes of end-stage renal disease. This condition typically arises in patients with long-standing diabetes mellitus, and its hallmark feature on kidney biopsy is the presence of Kimmel-Steele-Wilson nodules, which serve as a key diagnostic finding for nodular glomerulosclerosis. In this case, we have a 55-year-old woman who presents with progressive swelling around her ankles and face, worsening over the last one to two months. On physical examination, she has two plus pitting edema in the lower extremities and trace edema in the upper extremities, along with noticeable periorbital edema. Her cardiopulmonary examination is unremarkable, helping to rule out any cardiac related causes of her edema. Laboratory results show a serum creatinine level of 2.0 milligrams per deciliter and a low serum albumin of 2.8 grams per deciliter. A urinalysis reveals three plus proteinuria without hematuria or casts consistent with nephrotic syndrome. A kidney biopsy in this patient demonstrates Kimmel-Steele-Wilson nodules, which are characteristic of nodular glomerulosclerosis. These nodules are located in the peripheral mesangium, are typically ovoid or spherical in shape, and exhibit a lamellated appearance. On staining, they are eosinophilic on H and E stain and PAS positive, further supporting the diagnosis of diabetic nephropathy. Pathophysiology behind this involves diabetic nephropathy, a chronic complication seen in both type 1 and type 2 diabetes mellitus. It is the primary cause of nodular glomerulosclerosis, which involves the excessive deposition of mesangial matrix within the glomeruli. Over time, this leads to mesangial expansion, resulting in the formation of Kimmel-Steele-Wilson nodules. These nodules in turn compress glomerular capillaries, gradually impairing glomerular function. In diabetic nephropathy, hyperglycemia promotes non-enzymatic glycosylation of proteins in the basement membrane, leading to thickening of the glomerular basement membrane and hyaline arteriolosclerosis. The result is progressive proteinuria, which can evolve into full-blown nephrotic syndrome. Nephrotic syndrome itself is marked by peripheral edema, heavy proteinuria, hypoalbuminemia, and a bland urine sediment, meaning there are no dysmorphic red blood cells or casts present. In this case, the patient's edema is directly related to her proteinuria and hypoalbuminemia, both classic indicators of nephrotic syndrome. In summary, this case of nodular glomerulosclerosis is most consistent with diabetic nephropathy. The Kimmel-Steele-Wilson nodules seen on biopsy combined with the clinical picture of nephrotic syndrome in a patient with long-standing diabetes mellitus strongly support this diagnosis. This condition represents irreversible glomerular damage, and without proper management, patients with diabetic nephropathy often experience a rapid decline in kidney function, potentially leading to end-stage renal disease. That's all in this video. Please make sure to review these key points for your exams and stay tuned for more high-yield nephrology cases. Thank you for joining this episode of the Metacaucus video series. Stay tuned for more high-yield discussions on topics that frequently appear in your NBME and USMLE exams.